Hello, this is just a short example of how we can use custom model binding in .NET Core. I've created a fairly simple sample web application here with a controller called person controller and a single method which gets a, the name of a person. So this method is passed in the ID, which we then go and look up the person from the backend store. If the person exists, we return the name, otherwise we return not found. The backend store itself is very simple. If it has an ID of 10, we know we can return a person with the name of David. Otherwise, we just simply pass back null. One thing to note is I've got the nullability checks enabled. So because we're returning null from here, we're getting a warning. So we need to make this into a question mark. OK, that's all good. So we just see this working. And the easiest way to test this is just from, by calling it from PowerShell in this case. You can also test it in the browser. That's working. So I'm going to call it passing in an ID of 10. As you can see, that was successful and returned content of David. If I give it any other ID, I get a 404 error. If I give it a non numeric ID, I get a bad request. So this code's obviously fine and works great. However, there's quite a lot of plumbing in order to do something quite straightforward. The idea of model binding is instead of passing in the ID, we'd actually pass the person object in itself. So in this case, we'd like our code to look more like this, in which case we wouldn't need to fetch the person from the database and we wouldn't need to inject the store. As I mentioned before, we, we've got nullability checks enabled. So this means that this person can never be null at this point. So we need to put a question mark after it to allow it to be null. So, so how do we actually bind this person? Well, there's a good Microsoft article, custom model binding which goes through the steps we need to do. So we'll follow those steps now. The first thing against the model, which you're going to inject, which is person in this case, you need to say it's going to be bound and what we're going to use to bind it. So we, um, you can either write a custom binding provider or you can add an attribute. So we're just going to add a, an attribute in this case for model binder. So binder type is the, is the class that's actually going to do the binding for us. So we'll create okay, a new class called person binder. And then you can also optionally give it the name of the property you're going to bind. So in this case, ours is person ID. So that matches this. OK, so now we need to create a new class to do the actual binding. So this class has to inherit from I model binder. And it just has a single interface we need to implement. I'm just going to copy the code out of the example and then we can change it to suit our needs. Okay, so the, the first part of this code is just purely for finding the name of the property we're binding, so person ID in this case. We then read that value from the supplied root, so this will be what place for our person ID. If it hasn't been provided, that's an error. If it has been provided but it's not an integer, then that's also an error. So at this point, we know we've got something that looks like a valid person ID, so we need to go and fetch the person from our persistence layer. So as we were doing with the controller, we need to inject our data layer. Once we've got our data layer, we can then call the method to go and fetch the person using the ID. Idea up the code. So just to summarize, we, we look up the name of the property, we then read the value of the property, we then validate it looks correct. If it's not, we add it as a model, model error. If we have got a valid property, we can then go and fetch our person. And at this point, model is either person or null, and we set that into the results which return back. So if we try running our web application again. And 
attempt if we try our same three tests as before. So, success. Oops, sorry. An error. And some rubbish. So if we turn to our controller, you can see we've got a lot less code now. Uh, however, if you're only actually saving one line of code, really, which is where you're fetching the person from the persistence there. So you have to decide whether this is actually worth the overhead of the slightly more magic approach where something's happening behind the scenes. It's no longer immediately obvious what's going on. Also, the documentation advises um, against doing this for this particular use case because you can't really tell the difference between an error and also a person not existing. Thank you for watching.